Hi, it's Chris Flanagan. Welcome to the Pediatric Emergencies Podcast. So I'm back today with another 10 critical care pearls for you, and this is probably going to be the last episode in this series, um, certainly for now anyway. Um, But before I get to today's episode, I want to make a couple of announcements. So hopefully you're enjoying the series of lectures from the Pediatric Emergencies Waiting for the Retrieval Team conference that we held back in April of this year. Um, I've been releasing those lectures as videos and audio podcasts, um, one per week over the last few months. And I've got about another five or so of those that will be coming over the coming weeks. So if you are enjoying that series, we are planning on repeating our conference um, next year in 2020. And I've been working with Tom Waterfield to try and put a programme together for this. So at the moment, just a few provisional details for you at the moment. We are planning a three-day event in June 2020. We're going to start off on the 4th of June with our Pediatric Emergencies Intubation course. That's going to be our pre-conference course. It's open for booking at the moment and the programme for that is available, which is pretty rare for that course that we actually still have some places left on it. So if you're interested in going to that, you can book on paediatricemergencies.com. Following that, on Friday the 5th of June 2020, we're going to have our main conference day. It's going to be lecture-based, like last year. And one of the comments we had from last year was that people were keen to have a bit more interaction. So on Saturday the 6th of June 2020, we're planning a simulation, um, paediatric emergency simulation day. It's obviously going to be a smaller group more face-to-face interaction with a good opportunity to ask questions and to get a bit more involvement with the faculty. So at this stage, it's really just to let you know the dates um, so you can keep those free if you're interested in coming. We're putting the programme together over the next month or so, so keep an eye out on the website, paediatricemergencies.com and social media for details of that programme and booking details. And the last thing I should have mentioned is the, the conference is going to be held in Riddle Hall in Belfast. Okay, so let's get to the paediatric critical care pearls. So starting off with pearl number 51, and that is cross-match blood products early in the resuscitation of a child with meningococcal septicemia. And that sounds obvious in itself, and while most of you are probably sending a group and save in these patients as part of a meningococcal pack or a screen of bloods that you do when these child, children come through the door. A lot of you aren't actually cross-matching blood products right from the start. And while I don't advocate doing this for every child with sepsis, I would recommend it for that crashing patient with meningococcal septicemia who's profoundly hypotensive, who it's fairly clear from the outset is going to need to go down the intensive care route. So they're likely to need intubated ventilators, they're going to need vasoactive drugs, they're going to need invasive lines putting in. These children are highly likely to need blood products during their initial resuscitation. They're likely to need lots of fluid boluses. And if, obviously, cross-matching blood products takes time. So if you carry on down your resuscitation route, you get distracted with putting your lines in, you give your fluid boluses, you get the child intubated, you put them on vasoactive drugs, and all down the line your blood product, your blood results are going to come back. They're obviously going to be um, quite gliopathic. They're likely to need FFP, probably some cryoprecipitate. If their platelets are low, they're likely to need some platelets. We're going to target probably higher haemoglobin levels in these children it's most of them are going to be targeting 100 to ensure they deliver good oxygen around the body so you're likely to need to give some blood particularly after you've diluted their circulating volume down with lots of boluses of fluid and the problem with if you wait until you've worked that out you're probably talking another 40 minutes before your blood products are available over those 40 minutes the chances are your child is going to need more fluid boluses which is further going to cause the haemoglobin to be diluted down further. With those clear fluids, you're going to um, worsen the acidosis. You're going to worsen the coagulopathy. So it makes sense when 
we know what's likely to happen to this child. So rather than sending the group and save right at the start, I would encourage you to cross match blood products. Because by the time those blood products are available, the chances are you're going to be ready for them. You'll probably have pushed in at least 60 mils per kilo of clear fluid. And when you're ready for your next fluid bolus, rather than giving more fluid, you can actually give something useful to the child. You can give them some blood. You can give them some FFP. You can give them some cryo. Something they're going to need. And avoid making a problem worse. So I think I don't like I said I don't advocate this for every septic child, but the child who is in septic shock, who's likely to need intensive care support, to me this just makes sense rather than sending a group and save right from the start, cross match your blood products. If you don't need to give them, you can always phone the blood bank back and cancel them at a later stage. But that wait for blood products, um, if somebody hasn't done it at the start, is it's quite frustrating. Okay, pearl number 52, and that is remember with vasoactive drugs, in most cases, you're trying to return cardiac function and afterload to normal. So don't just keep turning the infusions up when they're not working. So this comes back to really your understanding of what you're trying to do with vasoactive drugs. And this is something when I was training, I often find quite confusing. Because when you're using ionotropes and vasoactive drugs, using it as an ionotrope, you're making the heart beat more forcefully than what it's doing. You're making it beat slightly quicker for most of them. So the heart is going to be using more oxygen, working harder, and because it's going slightly quicker, it's going to have less time to fill. And the other thing that you're doing with vasoactive drugs is you're generally, for most of them, the ones that are vasoconstrictors anyway, is you're increasing the afterload. So this is, so you're making the pipes narrower, so the heart then has to pump harder to get blood out. And I used to wonder, why are we doing this to our patients? Surely that's going to make things worse rather than better. And it really comes down to the fact that with these drugs, you're not trying to make the heart beat excessively fast, excessively forceful, or squeeze the afterload excessively down. What you're trying to do is return it to normal. So if your heart isn't beating forcefully enough, the inotrope is to make it beat back at a normal level of contraction. Not excessively more than normal, but to, you want to titrate your dose so the heart is beating with a normal force of contraction. You want to try ideally and keep the heart rate in the normal range. And importantly, with the afterload, you want to bring it back to normal, but not to over constrict things. So starting vasoactive drugs and titrating them in a patient who's unwell is a complex task. And you have to pick the agent depending on what you want it to do. And you need to use your dose. All the vasoactive drugs do different things at different doses. So you need to use a dose that's going to do what you want it to do. And the big problem is your patient will quite often change from one type of shock to another. So a treatment that you're giving one minute can be wrong or harmful the next minute. So the common one I'm alluding to with this peril is a child who you start on vasoactive drugs, but they become overconstricted. So you increase the afterload too much. So you have to remember with vasoactive drugs, everybody's obsessed with targeting a blood pressure. But it's not the blood pressure that's important. It's flow to the organs that's important. So if you give your patient too much of a vasoconstrictor, squeeze the afterload down too much, it's going to be harder for the heart to pump blood through those narrowed pipes. So the heart's going to have to work harder. And also you're going to get less flow to your organs. The chances are your venous sats are going to be low. Your lactate's going to increase. And your patient's going to look poorly perfused. You're not going to be able to feel their peripheral pulses. The cap refill is going to be prolonged. So you're going to have a patient that looks worse. And the common thing, well, it's not a common thing, but certainly in a number of situations I've seen, what people do is they just keep turning the vasoactive drugs up 
they've got a patient that's worsening in front of them, so they keep going up on the doses of the drugs. Where in this particular situation, what they need to do is either come down on the doses, so to allow the afterload to relax a little bit and get more flow out to the tissues, or they need to look and maybe change their strategy, add it in an iodilator instead. So I think the key thing with this is, with vasoactive drugs, remember, you're trying to return things to normal in most cases. So pick your drug, depending on what you want it to do. Use a dose that is likely to do that. Reassess your patient and adjust things depending on what's happening with them. And when things aren't working, look and see what's happening. Um, again, decide what you want to happen and make a sensible adjustment to try and achieve that rather than just keep turning the drugs up when things aren't working. Okay, moving on to pearl number 53. And that is consider using vasopressin as the first line vasopressor in children with pulmonary hypertension or using it early when other agents that work on the alpha receptors haven't been effective. And don't forget about calcium infusion for shock resistant to all other vasopressors. So here I've really squeezed in a couple of pearls together because all these other series have had um, 10 pearls rather than 11. So I'm trying to keep with that. Starting with the vasopressin, one of the nice things about vasopressin is it is selective for the systemic circulation. A lot of the other vasopressors, they will cause vasoconstriction of the systemic and the pulmonary circulation, whereas vasopressin causes, it's quite a potent vasoconstrictor of the systemic circulation, but doesn't have an effect on the pulmonary circulation. So it's perfect for kids with pulmonary hypertension who you want to cause some vasoconstriction of their systemic circulation. It's important that you do want that vasoconstriction of the systemic circulation rather than inotropy. But if that's what you want, it's a good drug to use first line. So most of the time in kids when we want a, a vasopressor, we tend to start with noradrenaline. But this is maybe a situation where you may want to go with vasopressin in pulmonary hypertension. And because most of the time we reserve vasopressin for when noradrenaline has failed. The other place you should maybe think about vasopressin is when a lot of the drugs you're using that work on the alpha receptors as its um, modality for causing vasoconstriction um, aren't working particularly well rather than keeping going with the same type of drugs. So the likes of dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, they cause vasoconstriction through alpha receptors. So if they're not working, so for example, if you're on 20 of dopamine and it's not working particularly well and you add in some noradrenaline and it's still not working, it might be an indication that you maybe should think of moving to a drug that works on another receptor and starting vasopressin fairly early in a patient like that sounds like a good idea to me. So you don't have to reserve it until you've maxed out all your doses. If it becomes obvious that a certain, if you've been using a number of drugs that work on the same receptor and they're not working, go with something different. And then the final thing on this pearl is not forgetting about the calcium infusion as for a patient who's resistant to all other vasopressors. So you've, you've added in your vasopressin by this stage and things aren't working. I've already talked about this in a number of podcasts and I've talked about it in um, a previous peril is not forgetting about your calcium when your vasoactive drugs aren't working because most of them will you increase intracellular calcium as a way that they work. So if your calcium is low, it's a good reason why your vasoactive drugs won't be working. This is a slightly different situation. We're assuming that you've try to rectify your calcium and you're not going on to the calcium infusion to keep calcium levels in the normal range. This is this is something that I've used a number of times and it has rescued a patient where everything else hasn't worked. So you're on silly doses of adrenaline, noradrenaline, you've maxed out vasopressin, you're on steroids, you've filled the patient up with plenty of fluid and nothing's working. You can use calcium as a continuous infusion to cause um, vasoconstriction. And 
again, like I say, I've, met, I've used this in a number of patients where everything else has failed and it's allowed me to keep that patient safe until they've got over their septic shock or whatever else has caused them to be profoundly hypotensive. So it's something to think about when you've when your vasopressin's not working, you've looked at everything else, you may as well give a calcium infusion a go. Okay, so moving on to peril number 54. Um, and this is the last one in the sepsis vasoactive drug theme. So it is, if your septic patient isn't responding to treatment, consider whether you've got the correct diagnosis or whether there's a problem with your treatment. So a lot of patients can start off with sepsis, but they can develop other problems. Or there's lots of things that mimic sepsis, which may not be sepsis. So you need to be you need to have a differential diagnosis in the back of your mind that when the patients and you're doing interventions and they're not responding as they should, that you can then go through and make sure you're not missing anything. So this is the differential that I tend to run through, and I've seen all these as problems at some stage. So I think the first thing is to make sure your patient doesn't have a mechanical cause of shock rather than sepsis. And like I've said, a lot of a lot of these can start off as sepsis and develop because of interventions or deteriorations in the patient. So by mechanical cause, I'm talking about tension pneumothorax, a pericardial tamponade, and abdominal compartment syndrome. So you've intubated and ventilated the patient. They're, they could have started off with sepsis and then developed a tension pneumothorax. So your patient's deteriorating. Think about repeating the chest x-ray or ultrasound in the chest to make sure they don't have a tension pneumothorax. Septic patients have lots of leaky capillaries. They're going to get fluid in all their compartments, so they're at risk of developing tamponade. So putting the echo probe onto the heart and making sure there's not a pericardial effusion that is significantly affecting the heart is a step that you should be doing when you're trying to work out why your patient is not responding as they should. Abdominal compartment syndrome will impair venous return coming back to the heart. So again, there's certain groups of patients that are high risk for this. So again, you can measure the abdominal compartments by looking at bladder pressure in these patients if you're worried about this. Certainly I've seen lots of surgical emergencies mislabeled as sepsis. So you're thinking about things like volvulus into susception, um, there are certainly things you should be worried about. If your lactate's not clearing, um, is there actually dead gut as the cause rather than difficulty delivering oxygen to the tissues? Myocarditis, I've seen it plenty of times mislabeled as sepsis at the start. So again, a, a key reason for putting an echo probe on all these patients. Congenital heart disease, again, you're, it's in the differential diagnosis of your collapsed knee in it. Sepsis and congenital heart disease goes go together. You need to consider both of them in any neonate that collapses. DKA, um, I've seen this both ways round. Um, so I've seen patients who have actually turned out to have DKA mislabeled as sepsis. Um, and I've seen patients who um, actually turned out to have sepsis mislabeled as DKA. Um, it's also important to think about toxin ingestion. Um, because that can present just like sepsis. And again, it's one of my favourite simulations that I run as the patient sold us sepsis, comes up to the ICU, who's actually had some tricyclics. And then there's other features that will maybe point you down. This isn't how a septic patient should be behaving. Again, hemorrhage is another one, um, particularly again, that collapsed neonate, um, non-accidental injury. Um, there's, you can be concealed blood um, that won't maybe be obvious at the start and with the small circulating volume in a neonate they kind of bled out a significant proportion of their blood volume into their head or into their abdomen and that might be the cause of their shock rather than sepsis. Think about arrhythmias as well. SVT that's particularly been going on for a long time can impair uh, cardiac function um, and the reason the heart rate's up is actually an arrhythmia rather than it's up uh, as a compensatory mechanism. Um, myocardial infarction and pulmonary embolism, again, are rare in children, but they can happen. Adrenal insufficiency is important to think about 
hypothyroidism. Is this a metabolic disorder? Again, one of the things you need to consider in your differential diagnosis of a clapsinated in particular. So I think it's important. This is my, some of the differentials I've put together. And when I have a patient that's labelled as sepsis, being treated as sepsis, but maybe isn't behaving just how they should, or they're not getting better, it's something I get out and run through. Could it be this? Could it be this? Could it be this? Um, I make sure that I've looked at everything. Okay, moving on to peril number 55. And that is, don't intubate an asthmatic unnecessarily. However, don't delay intubation for the patient in extremis. And that pearl is sort of, it's two-edged. Um, it's designed at one for the people who don't recognise how high a risk a procedure it is intubating a patient with asthma. And the second part is designed for those who do realise just how risky it is and might want to put it off. So looking at the first bit, um, intubating a patient for asthma is actually one of the groups of patients that I am really, really worried about doing. The time most asthmatics die is on intubation or immediately following intubation. And that's because you've taken a patient who is obviously not in a good place, but you're, the things you're going to have to do with them, one, they don't really have a great effect on the disease process. So you're putting a tube into the upper airways. All the problems with asthma are down below that. But you put your patient at risk of so many other problems. They're using high pressures to move their chest. You're causing the risk of air leaks and pneumothoraces. And you increase the risk of our trapping by taking over their respiration. But obviously, if you have no choice, that's the situation you're going to have to you're going to have to go with. But these are patients that, if I'm intubating an asthmatic patient, I'm probably going to be in their bed space for the rest of the shift. It's not a patient I can intubate and go away from. They're an awful lot of work. Um, you're going to be struggling to ventilate them, struggling to oxygenate them. You're going to be using insanely high pressures. You're going to be just about getting by with oxygenation. You may be targeting SATs of 88, 85. You're, going to, you're not going to be able to ventilate them to normal CO2s. You're going to be maybe letting the CO2s rise up as high as 10, even higher, up to 14 in certain cases if you're struggling. So your you know, pH is above 7.2 are absolutely fine. So if your patient is in 40% oxygen on a bit of high flow uh, and saturating at 92, and you compare that to the patient who I've just talked about by intubating and ventilating them where you're going to go to, that, and the patient's not particularly tiring, that's not a patient you should be unnecessarily intubating. You need to maximise your asthma treatment, the things that work in the bronchospasm, and try and avoid you getting into that situation. So I know it can be tempting. You want the patient out of your hospital, putting a tube in, gets them out, they go to the ICU. But that's a very high risk intervention you're doing for that particular patient. So you need to try and avoid it at all costs. So have you maximised everything you can do with the asthma um, to try and avoid intubation? It's not a patient you want to put a tube in unnecessarily. Coming on to the second part of that, once it's obvious the patient is over the hill and they're going to need intubated, because the people who generally are intubating these patients, they know how high risk a procedure it is. They know that until the retrieval team come and pick up this child, they're probably going to be struggling with this patient. There can almost be a temptation to put it off. But once it becomes clear the patient's going to be need intubated, everything that has been tried has been tried. It's a patient you should get on ahead and get them intubated. You shouldn't put it off. Obviously, you want to get all the right people there to make sure it's done safely. But once you have that, you just need to get on and get them intubated. So it's make sure you do everything you can to avoid intubating the patient and don't intubate them unless they really need it. But once it's obvious they need intubated, 
don't delay things once you've got everything there that you ha you need to to do the procedure safely. Okay, moving on to pearl number 56. And that is outside the setting of a difficult airway, using a gas induction in a critically ill child with difficult intravenous access is unlikely to be a good plan. And that's a fairly common thing to do during um, elective anaesthesia. It can be difficult to get a line in the child. Once they've gone off to sleep with a gas induction, their veins will dilate, they're not fighting, and it's much easier to get a cannula in, and then you can carry on with what you need to do. Now, the problem with doing that in a sick child is that sick children tend to decompensate on induction of anaesthesia. So if your sick child decompensates on you, you don't have a line in to treat the problems, and also you don't have an airway either, you can get yourself into a difficult situation. Obviously, this is what is done quite routinely in difficult airways. Obviously, if you try to cannulate a child with, for example, bacterial tracheitis, um, you can cause complete airway obstruction. So that child will need a gas induction and then you'll get access after they've gone to sleep. But outside that setting for acutely unwell children, a gas induction isn't a great plan because the, the volatile anaesthetic agent that you give them is a vasodilator. So it's going to cause them to drop their blood pressure. The whole process of going to sleep, switching from negative pressure ventilation to positive pressure ventilation, is going to affect their blood pressure, it's going to impair venous return coming back to the heart. Their own catecholamine production is going to go down as they go to sleep. And if you don't have a line in to deal with any problems that occur, you can get yourself in trouble very quickly. So for those children, I think it's much better to get an IO in so you can give them a safe anaesthetic um, and then you can get your intravenous access later when they're asleep. Okay, so moving on to pearl number 57, and that is, don't forget about the Goodell airway once you leave the resuscitation course. So this one is really aimed at preparing a patient for intubation. Um, I think we're all fairly good at remembering Goodell airways when you're in a resuscitation scenario. Anethas are very good in this situation of preparing a patient for intubation of using Goodell's, but other specialties in my experience maybe don't always remember about it. Um, and a common scenario I see is as the child goes off to sleep and their airway tone starts to go down, the tongue falls back and blocks off the airway. So this is recognised by the person looking after the airway, so they'll maybe try adjusting the head position. They'll then maybe try a two-person technique. But quite often that doesn't maybe improve things. At this stage, the, the chest isn't going up and down. The stomach's starting to fill. And the child's saturations will start to fall. But at this, you can see the sort of an atmosphere of panic starts to set in. And there's a feeling that, okay, we'll better get on and have a quick look in the airway and try and get the child intubated quickly. So there's a number of problems with this. Um, I think the first is that you've used up your pre-oxygenation. With the SATs starting to fall, you're not going to have an awful lot of time to get the tube in. Because you're going ahead and intubating before your muscle relaxants worked, you're not going to have good intubation conditions. And the third thing is your frame of mind as you're intubating isn't at its best. You're going in in a panic in that I need to get this tube really quickly. So that's not the best way to do the procedure. And there is an alternative to this. And the alternative is when your patient becomes difficult to face mask ventilate, you pick up the pre-sized Goodell airway sitting to your right and put it into the patient. And nine times out of ten, Difficult face mask ventilation becomes straightforward face mask ventilation. So you can keep your pre-oxygenation, you can allow your muscle relaxer to work and have good intubating conditions, and importantly, you can do the intubation in a calm, controlled way, and your chances of success are going to be much, much higher with this. And all because of a simple little bit of plastic. 
So I would strongly recommend that whenever you're doing an intubation, pre-size a Goodell airway, have it sitting beside the patient and out of all the interventions you can do to improve difficult face mask ventilation, putting the Goodell in would be the first one I would often try. Okay, so moving on, pearl number 58, uh, and that is don't forget about laryngospasm and have a plan to deal with it. So this one is primarily aimed at paediatricians. Um, and I started my training as a paediatrician, so this is why I know about this. This is underneath that is bread and butter. This is something they encounter fairly regularly, know how they're going to deal with it and have everything to hand to deal with it. But it's quite often something that surprises paediatricians and actually a lot of the things that paediatricians will do round about instrumenting airways are high risk for causing laryngospasm. So what is laryngospasm? Um, it's involuntary spasm of the vocal cords in a closed position. And it can come on with a local stimulus, for example, instrumenting the airway, suctioning around the cords, or it can actually be um, a stimulus peripherally, so it can be cannulation in a light plane of anaesthesia. So this is high risk for things that paediatricians do, and the reason I say that is because quite often they will intubate babies without um, proper anaesthesia, so it's done quite often with a little bit of sedation with, uh, for example, an opioid, but no muscle relaxant. They'll be putting feeding tubes down to give surfactant again with just some sedation rather than muscle relaxant. And they intubate babies in delivery suite without um, any anaesthesia um, in some situations. So these are all situations you're instrumenting in airway in a child who's either lightly sedated or has um, no drugs on board. So you're high risk of causing laryngospasm. And laryngospasm isn't as well recognised and taught about in paediatrics as it is in anaesthesia. And certainly I, I can remember the first time I saw laryngospasm. Um, it was a little neonate. I was intubating in delivery suite. I put the laryngoscope in. I had a good view. But for some reason the cords were fixed and closed. And I wasn't able to pass the tube. At that stage I hadn't seen this before. I hadn't heard about laryngospasm. So really wasn't sure what I should do when it occurred again. How I could prevent it. And I got a whole lot of treatment advice that maybe wasn't the best um, advice and wouldn't go with the standard management. So when you deal with laryngospasm, there's a few things you need to do. One is obviously you need to try and administer oxygen and PEEP to the patient. Um, so with the PEEP, you're trying to force some oxygen down past the, the cords. And then you need to do something to break the spasm. And your, your options for doing that are one, you can significantly deepen the anaesthetic. Uh, an agent like propofol is a great drug for doing that. Or you can provide some muscle relaxant to um, cause the cords to open. And then you can face mask ventilate your patient or intubate them. But obviously if you have that situation where your cords are fixed and closed, you're not going to be able to buy valve mask your patient and you're going to not be able to, to intubate them with the cords fixed and closed in that position. So it's something you need to, one, realise that when you're poking about in an airway um, in a patient who may not be properly anaesthetised or muscle relaxed, there's a risk of you causing laryngospasm. And for example, this newer technique where you're passing feeding tubes through cords uh, to give surfactant, this is a high risk procedure for doing this or intubating a baby in delivery suite without any drugs on board. It's a high risk procedure. So you need to have thought about in advance, if my patient suddenly gets laryngospasm, what am I going to do about it? Particularly because a lot of these babies are going to be fairly small. Drawing up the doses of the drugs that you're going to give to treat the problem is going to be quite complex. So you need to have thought about a system in advance about how you're going to manage laryngospasm if it occurs. Because if it occurs and you're not prepared, the consequences can be disastrous. Okay, moving on to pearl number 59. 
and this is a short and sweet one and that is make sure you remove high flow prongs before starting face mask ventilation. This is something I've seen a number of times and it's something I've tried myself in the past and it just doesn't work very well. You're not going to get a great seal with the mask over the top of high flow prongs and any advantages of leaving the high flow prongs on are going to be at a significant disadvantage due to the poor seal and the poor face mask ventilation you're going to get when you try to bag the patient. So with Thrive and other techniques with for apneic oxygenation, leaving high flow on uh, has become more popular um, during intubation. The big problem with doing this in kids is that you don't get a great seal with a mask over the top of high flow prongs. And because it's very rare, we'll do a classical rapid sequence induction in children. So by that I mean you give your induction agent a muscle relaxant and then you don't bag the patient for the 40 seconds a minute you're waiting for those drugs to work. You just provide oxygen, um, possibly PEEP as well, and then you intubate the patient once the drugs have worked. That's something we rarely do in kids. Most kids will get a modified rapid sequence, so they're going to get face mask ventilation while you're waiting for your drugs to work, and then you're going to intubate them. And the problem with the high flow prongs being on is you're not going to get a great seal. So your face mask ventilation is going to be significantly worse than it would be if you had removed the prongs. And that is a much bigger advantage to give good face mask ventilation rather than the few seconds it takes to remove the prongs or the advantages you get from leaving prongs on during an intubation attempt. Um, and again, it's something I've seen recently being done. Uh, and in fact, actually, in the same patient, um, pearl number 60 um, came in, and that is reposition the nasogastric tube if abdominal distension during face mask ventilation isn't improving with aspiration. So this is a big problem for us in kids. Um, when you're providing face mask ventilation, particularly in a small baby, Although you're hoping most of your error is going to go down to the lungs, a significant proportion goes down to the stomach. And in a small baby, it doesn't take long for that gastric distension to splint the diaphragm and make face fast ventilation difficult, if not impossible. So if you don't have an NG tube in at the start, you need to have one ready in the bed space that you can put in quickly should the abdomen become very distended and start to affect face mask ventilation. And for most neonates, I am going to put an NG tube in at the start. I'm then going to allocate one person to continuously aspirate that tube during face mask ventilation. So this is where this uh, pearl comes in. So if you're doing face mask ventilation, quite often the tube goes in, you haven't screened it with an x-ray, you're assuming it's in the right place. But if during that aspiration, the stomach is continuing to distend, that can happen, but if you're just bagging in excessive amounts of air, you can put more in, more air into the stomach quicker than somebody can get it out. But if the person in, uh, aspirating the air isn't getting air out of the syringe, that tells you that your tube is not in the right place, and you might want to adjust the position. The other, the other situation I've had this in, the, the person was just continuously aspirating air, but the um, abdomen wasn't coming down and that's because the tube in this situation was still in the esophagus. So when the tube is advanced in a little bit further suddenly the abdominal distension uh, disappeared. So if you're bagging a patient and the abdominal distension is continuing despite somebody aspirating the NG tube consider moving the NG tube either up or down to try and see does that make a difference to getting air out of the stomach because it can make a real difference to how you ventilate the child. Okay, so that was another 10 paediatric critical care pearls for you. Um, I hope you found them useful. Like I say, that's me exhausted for pearls for the moment anyway. So I'm going to have to have a think about what I do for the next podcast. Um, but certainly over the next few weeks, I'm going to keep putting out the talks from this year's 
paediatric emergencies waiting for the retrieval team event. Um, and I'll try and get another podcast out on a slightly different topic over the next month or so. Thanks for listening.